Peter B. Collins. Peter B. Collins News and Comment. It's Wednesday, March 27th, 2019. In response to the mosque shootings in New Zealand, Facebook has announced a new plan to ban pro-white uh, nationalist and pro-white supremacist content from its pages. And on Facebook, my liberal fa- friends are cheering this announcement. And I am really sorry to see that. Now, let me be very clear in case you have any other illusions. I do not in any way support white hate speech, radical white supremacist groups, the extremists who populate our nation, like Adam Waffen, which has been revealed by A.C. Thompson in his excellent frontline reporting in the past six months. But inevitably, the effort to purge speech that is deemed to be hateful insightful, or otherwise dangerous will be seen as arbitrary and it will become a process that undermines the exercise of true free speech. And I recognize this is a very difficult set of issues. But I'm an extremist when it comes to the First Amendment. And whether it's Alex Jones or a white nationalist who is a member of an armed group, unless their commentary crosses criminal behavior, the line of criminal behavior, I say let them speak. Because when you suppress that speech, you only compound the problem. You drive them underground, they find 4chan, 8chan, 12chan, whatever chan they think they need, They will express themselves. They will use the Internet. And I actually think that it's better for society to let them speak so that we know who they are and what they believe and legal methods to monitor any potential criminal behavior can be undertaken. And so Facebook's announcement, it's clear that these concepts are deeply linked to organized hate groups and have no place on our services. Over the past three months, our conversations with members of civil society and academics who are experts in race relations around the world have confirmed that white nationalism and separatism cannot meaningfully be separated from white supremacy and organized hate groups. So the plan is, if somebody from the Daily Stormer posts a hateful comment, Well, users will be directed to the website of the nonprofit Life After Hate that works to de-radicalize people drawn into hate groups. Now, I think that's silly. Do you really think that some deep-seated racist is going to go to what he or she sees as some kind of a 12-step program or an anger management program? program because they get a suggestion after they post something on Facebook. So I'm really sorry to see this development. And I know there are a lot of people who think we need to be protected. In another change to Facebook's moderation policy, they announced that anti-vaccine misinformation would appear less frequently across my news feeds. Now, This is another issue where I feel people have a right to full, unfettered free speech. I have my own questions about vaccinations. I have been vaccinated. Uh, My stepson was vaccinated. Uh, I'm not an activist on this issue. But I have the concerns in mind of people who are afraid of the 25 vaccinations recommended for today's Uh, zero to five population. And the thimerosal carrier that many people believe is linked to autism, 
these are serious issues that parents have to grapple with, and to censor their expression. And this one is a little sneakier than what they're doing to the white nationalists. They're just going to bury their posts. They're not going to ban them. And this raises the deep questions about who gets to decide what speech is free and what is not. Is it underpaid content moderators in the Philippines or in Ireland, empowered by Facebook, to make these decisions? And I don't have an easy answer, but censorship is not the answer for me. I want to recommend a deep dive that Trevor Aronson just published recently at the Intercept. As you know, I've interviewed him many times over the years, as he has exposed the FBI's frame-up of hundreds of domestic terrorism suspects or accused individuals. And this analysis that he wrote today is really thoughtful. It's journalism because it covers many aspects of a controversial issue. And I don't find that Trevor Aronson is、uh, trying to impose his own views on the reader of this article. It's called "Terrorism's Double Standard," and what he points out is that the guy from Ohio, I think his name is Alex Fields. He's the one who drove his car into the crowd. Yeah, it's Alex Fields Jr. He drove his car into the crowd in Charlottesville, kill, killing Heather Hyatt. Heather Hyer, sorry. And in opening his article, Aronson compares that use of a car driven by ideology, conducting a violent crime, and attempting to intimidate. A larger group of people. That pretty well fits the broad definition of terrorism. But then he compares that to the case of a, a, an actual terrorist guy who was aligned with international terrorist groups, as identified by the U.S. State Department, and that's the case of Saifulo Saipov, the guy who rented the Home Depot truck and drove it through a bike lane in Lower Manhattan, killing eight people. And Aronson writes, Saipov's crime was almost identical to Fields, but Jeff Sessions, then the Attorney General, called his attack a calculated act of terrorism in the heart of one of our great cities. He was charged in federal court with murder and providing material support to the Islamic State. Continuing to quote from Aronson here, both Saipov and Fields grabbed the nation's attention. Both were extremists who allegedly turned vehicles into deadly weapons. But because one was motivated by a foreign extremist ideology and the other by a domestic one, federal prosecutors treated one as a terrorist and the other as a crazy white guy filled with rage. And in this、uh, 35-page exposition of this topic, Aronson does a very good job of offering both. Primary views. One is that if it's terrorism, we should try it as terrorism. We should have laws that deal with so-called domestic terrorism. And the other side is that these are crimes. And adding the label of terrorism may help the headlines. It may sell new, more newspapers, and、uh, you know, glue more eyeballs to a television newscast. But calling it terrorism is really just adding an emotional layer and potential additional prison time or other penalties. And so I recommend this read to you, and I will、uh, get in touch with、uh, Mr. Aronson and see if he's willing to submit to another Peter B. Collins podcast interview. But I think these are really important issues, and they deserve thoughtful reaction and analysis, and. If we are going to have new laws, we have to have a clear definition of terrorism, and we've got to end these FBI sting operations, where we have a case of a man who is serving prison time for attempting to explode a bomb that wasn't a bomb. And I find that just fundamentally <laughs> flawed. That. Well, how can you spend your life in prison for attempting to bomb somebody 
when there wasn't actually a bomb there. You had been duped by your FBI paid informants and handlers. So I recommend this. I have linked to it in the show file for today's podcast. Do take a look. The Russia Gators are not going quietly into the night. Let me once again stipulate that all we have to go on so far is Bill Barr's summary of Robert Mueller's report. And we're being told now that it will be weeks before that is released. And so Barr's analysis is going to stand as what we fight over. And I support the Democrats in their call for release of the full report, or as much as legally possible as can be shared with the public. But Adam Schiff, chair of the House Intelligence Committee, he rejects Bill Barr's summary. Undoubtedly, there is collusion. We will continue to investigate the counterintelligence issues. That is, the president or people around him compromised Uh, Were they compromised in any way by a hostile foreign power? It doesn't appear that that was any part of Mueller's report. Now, how do you know? That is speculation, again, based on the four-page summary that's been provided. And, of course, Schiff is under attack from the White House, pushing their blowback agenda for what is perceived as the failure of Mueller to prove conspiracy and to prove obstruction of justice. Now, Democrats maintain that Schiff isn't wrong in saying that there was evidence of collusion, and Congressman Peter Welch of Vermont, a Democrat, comes to his defense. It doesn't mean there wasn't an enormous amount of spoke. This was a fine legal distinction Mueller had to make. So they're saying there was collusion, but it didn't rise to a criminal level. Well, truth is... We don't know those details until we see the full Mueller report. Now, Schiff has bowed to pressure and has put the Intelligence Committee's investigation on hold. He announced that they will not be hearing uh, from Felix Sater, the former Trump executive. He was an FBI asset. He's a convicted criminal. He was marketing uh, Trump uh, condos in Russia. He was a guy who was central to the plans, the scheme, to develop a Trump project in Moscow. And so they're not letting go. Now, there are incompletes. We know that Michael Cohen testified that Trump used phony financial documents to get loans from Deutsche Bank. That is a criminal uh, activity that may be pursued. And Rachel Maddow isn't giving up. Last night, she ran through a whole litany of the incomplete cases that were launched by Mueller or referred to other jurisdictions by the special counsel. And that's fair. These are pending prosecutions, and we will see where they all lead. But enjoying the what they perceive as vindication, the Republicans are turning the tables on Adam Schiff, and they're basically repeating what he did to Devin Nunes, who was the chair of the Intelligence Committee, and he got caught collaborating with the White House, and ultimately he recused himself from the Russia investigation, but stayed on as chair of the Intelligence Committee. Now the Republicans are saying that Adam Schiff is uh, so tainted that he should take that advice that he gave to his former colleague Nunes in the past. And Rachel Maddow and the Britain-based Guardian are rehashing the story of Maria Butina without noting that it's been completely debunked by the great work of James Bamford. And I find this really frustrating. The Guardian, which typically has articles that print out two, three, maybe four pages at the most, they went deep on Maria Butina. She's got a sentencing hearing today. And they rehash all of the stuff, the love story, that she is some sort of a Russian spy, that her boyfriend Paul Erickson was duped by this red-headed Matahari type. And it has been debunked. And apparently... Over at MSDNC, they are not able to read the New Republic, 
where Jim Bamford published his piece several weeks ago. And as you know, I have my own issues with Bamford. Here he can expose the mainstream media's malfeasance over the Butina case, but he was unwilling to listen to the arguments and the evidence presented by Bill Binney about the DNC being the subject of a leak and not a hack. So I've linked to this Guardian article, and you can look at it for yourselves. And I've also linked to Jim Bamford's New Republic article. If you haven't read it yet, please do. You will find that the Maria Butina story, as promoted in the corporate media in this country, is 94% bullshit. <laughs> and yet, they are unbowed. I've been watching Rachel Maddow for that quick moment where she says, Hey, I fucked up. You know, I went a little bit too deep. I relied on too many anonymous sources. I didn't allow any critics of Russiagate to appear on my program for over two years. I sold you a pile of bull. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just daydreaming again. <laughs> Meanwhile, Aaron Maté, who I will nominate for a Pulitzer Prize, wrote it up at The Nation. Mueller's findings should finally put to rest the collusion theory that has consumed the mainstream media and political class for more than two years. The special counsel's office did not establish, quote, that members of the Trump campaign conspired or coordinated with the Russian government in its election interference activities. Mate says, time and again, the available evidence undermined the case for such a conspiracy. None of the characters presented to us as Russian agents or Trump Kremlin intermediaries were shown to be anything of the sort. None of the lies that Trump aides or allies were caught telling pointed us toward the collusion that members of the media and political figures insisted they were hiding. None of the various pillars of Russiagate, the Trump Tower meeting, the fanciful assertions of the Steele dossier, the anonymously sourced media claims such as Trump campaign members having repeated contacts with senior Russian intelligence officials, none of it ever led us to damning evidence. And all of that is likely why Mueller never charged anyone with involvement in or covering up a Trump-Russia conspiracy. A minimally, I'm still quoting, a minimally responsible media and political class would have acknowledged this reality. Instead, leading voices from cable news, Congress, and other influential perches promoted Russiagate by ignoring the countervailing evidence and those who pointed it out. They filled in the evidentiary holes with supposition, innuendo, and outright falsehood. That helps to explain the sizable number of dis discredited or retracted media reports that advance the notion of a Trump-Russia plot. Then he goes on to say that this has uh, drained the opposition to Trump with distraction. And uh, in the meantime, uh, he has done a lot of damage. Later, Mate writes, this massive gift to Trump should be grounds for a reckoning among those who presented it to him. Prominent media outlets that spun an outlandish tale of a compromised or even treasonous president should be held to account for the most catastrophic failure since the days when the media promoted the fiction of Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction. And accountability on this front may well serve Trump's self-promotional claims of a witch hunt, but it is vital that intelligence abuses be held to account as well, no matter the partisan consequences. And I agree with that. As I mentioned yesterday, I don't trust Lindsey Graham to conduct an unbiased investigation, but there are important threads to pursue. Did the CIA and the NSA collude with the FBI to develop those intelligence assessments that were vague, evidence-free, and in my view, highly misleading? And will there be an investigation of Stefan Halper and the British component of the Russiagate scandal? Well, we will see, and I hope that it happens. Every day I pause for a moment to thank the people who support my work here at the Peter B. Collins Podcast with your subscriptions. The My, my favorite Siri, not the one on my phone, Siri Walgren, she donates $5 a month. Catherine Hemnes just set up a $50 annual subscription. Marvin Rasmussen and Paul Karsh each donate $5 a month. 
I invite you to join them. Just visit PeterBCollins.com. Find the menu button, then find Become a Subscriber. You land on the sign-up page. It's easy to choose a PayPal level of support that's comfortable for you. The $50 annual subscription, if it's a new one, and you give me a mailing address here in the U.S., earns you the bonus book, Trump on the Couch, by Dr. Justin A. Frank. And uh, we'll be announcing a new bonus book in uh, the next week or so, just to make it a little more exciting. British Prime Minister Theresa May told her Conservative Party lawmakers today that she is prepared to step down before the next round of Brexit negotiations if they will only pass her Brexit deal. Now, the Speaker of the House of Commons has said no to that because they've already turned down the exact same deal twice before. Here's an alleged quote from Theresa May. I have heard very clearly the mood of the parliamentary party. I know there is a desire for a new approach, new leadership, and in the second phase of the Brexit negotiations, I won't stand in the way of that. I am prepared to leave this job earlier than I intended in order to do what is right for our country and our party. So she's saying, if you'll only approve this stinking package, I'll go away. <laughs> we'll see how all that turns out. Venezuela has been hit by a fourth major power blackout in the last three weeks. Twelve, about half of the country, is uh, suffering without electricity right now. This occurred today, and there were other blackouts on Monday. It's clear that the uh, grid is uh, compromised. We don't know if it's simply because of the lack of maintenance or if there was intervention by the U.S. And The Guardian, which once published a piece that was fairly balanced about, you know, whether it was uh, the just the lack of maintenance or whether it was some sort of uh, external interference. But today, they simply quote a guy, a 43-year-old preschool teacher, I feel hopeless and despair. What was the solution? Well, it's for this man to go. And I'm sorry, if you bounce Maduro tomorrow and even put Juan Guaido in power, you're telling me that the electrical grid will suddenly recover? Well, if that's the case, then external sabotage would have been proven. And by the way, we'll see if it works out tomorrow. I'm scheduled to interview author Dan Kavalik. He is in Caracas. And if the power's on, we'll talk to Dan. And if not, we probably won't be able to. Uh, he also has written a book uh, about the U.S. interference in elections worldwide going back for about uh, 70 years or so. And it is a fascinating look at U.S. Uh, intervention, not just meddling, intervention in the elections of other countries. Some international stories. India, which has presidential elections or prime ministerial elections coming up in a couple of weeks, just heard an announcement from Prime Minister Narendra Modi that they have joined the Space War Club. They claim that a missile test was successful, and they shot down a satellite somewhere up there in space. And, of course, this is driven in part by Obama and now Trump promoting a U.S. presence, a military presence in outer space. And it's a huge blunder. This is an area we should have left pristine, and we will live, well, we'll regret it, and we may not live to <laughs> fully regret it. I want to recommend a piece that is somewhat speculative, published at Mint Press News today, related to Ukraine. And there is a man who's come forward who spent, uh, let's see, uh, uh, about uh, 17 years working for the secret police in Ukraine. It's called the SBU. His name is Vasily Prozorov. And I want to be clear that he's a man who has some intimate knowledge. And what he has provided is testimony, but so far not evidence. Now, one of the things that he asserts is that uh, since the, uh, the Yanukovych coup and the loss of Crimea to Russia, that the Poroshenko government has been running a secret prison in eastern Ukraine, and they say that there has been torture and perhaps even murder committed at that facility. And there may be more than one. 
Now, he also says that while he is not a defector, he remains, uh, uh, his allegiance remains with Ukraine, but he did become an agent for Russia when he became concerned about、uh, what's been going on after the coup. So the secret prisons are one issue, and he also addresses the shootdown of Malaysian Airlines Flight 17, MH17, back in 2014. Now, this was promptly blamed on Russia by the post coup Ukrainian government and the Obama administration. But he suggests that Poroshenko had prior knowledge of the plan to shoot down a, a plane. And there is still discussion about whether they were trying to shoot down a plane they thought Putin was on or they intended to shoot down the Malaysian airliner. And he notes that when he tried to find out more about the shoot down, he was threatened don't poke your nose into this business if you don't wish to have problems. So、uh, his claims are, I think, very significant. Evidence is what we need next. And the Mint Press story has a couple of quotes from the late Robert Perry, who was digging into this story. Uh, in the last months before he died. So、uh, I, I encourage you to read it, read it critically, but I think it does raise important questions that we need to seek answers to. That murky group,、uh, the North Korean group of dissidents called the Chiyo Lima Civil Defense, they are accepting responsibility for that visit to the Embassy of North Korea in Madrid. They claim that they didn't go in with guns, they didn't hurt anybody,、uh, and that no Americans were involved. But one of their members did report on the incident to the FBI. Hmm, we'll see if those cover stories hold. Yesterday, oh, actually, it was today, the Senate defeated a motion to take up the Green New Deal. Now I have to correct myself again. The vote was late yesterday. Now, 43 Democrats voted present because they didn't want to play Mitch McConnell's gotcha game. The Green New Deal is a concept, it is not fully fleshed out. But Mitch McConnell wanted to land a major blow to it, and it really just produced a lot of hot air that can only further warm the planet. Yesterday, there were oral arguments at the Supreme Court regarding two gerrymander cases that have been brought up all the way to the High Court. And Justice Brett Kavanaugh seems to be pretty well versed on the issue, asked a lot of questions, and maybe this will produce a change. The court has treated as kryptonite any case related to partisan gerrymandering and avoided taking a stand to the level that we've reached today, which is just comical. The way partisans draw their districts. I have been holding on to stories about the Democratic presidential race and haven't had much time to cover them. So give me a couple of minutes here and let's breeze through them. Pete Buttigieg, who is the 37 year old mayor of South Bend, Indiana, hasn't formally announced for president. He's already placing third in an Iowa poll, right behind Joe Biden at 25%, Bernie Sanders 24%. And、uh, the guy whose name nobody knows how to pronounce is at 11% already. Joe Biden went public yesterday and expressed his sorrow, his、uh, maybe regret, at the way he handled the Anita Hill hearings. That was Clarence Thomas's Supreme Court confirmation. I was there in the room for the first phase before they discovered Anita Hill, and it was a ghastly exercise. Quote, To this day, I regret I couldn't come up with a way to give her the kind of hearing she deserved. And get this <laughs> Anita Hill has a running joke in her home. She said, Yeah, you know, when somebody rings the doorbell and we're not expecting company, we say, Oh, is that Joe Biden coming to apologize? <laughs> Beto O'Rourke, in his、uh, historic run against Ted Cruz, where he lost the Senate race in Texas, Was not forced to define himself on charter schools, but his wife Amy O'Rourke, who sits on a family fortune, is very active in Texas in the charter school movement, and Beto is going to have to answer questions about that sooner or later.、And、speaking of education, Kamala Harris, junior senator from California, is proposing 
to close the teacher pay gap by giving every teacher in America a raise of about thirteen thousand dollars. Now, I'm in favor of this in general, but it's a responsibility of the states, not the federal government. And when you plug federal money into programs like that, it inevitably inevitably gets cut down the road, and it's a mess. So I support the concept, but not the、uh, manner, the the plan to execute it in.、Uh, Harris also held a rally over the weekend in Atlanta, and she announced that、uh, you know it's time for the older leaders to pass the baton. Now she didn't mention that when Dianne Feinstein, 84, ran for re-election last year. <laughs> She's clearly targeting Biden and Bernie Sanders. Kirsten Gillibrand, meanwhile, has released her 2018 taxes and demands that、uh, others do the same. Bernie Sanders is still sitting on his, and I cannot fathom why he continues to、uh, allow that to be an issue.、Uh, Kamala Harris and Cory Booker have already released some tax returns, and Elizabeth Warren is the leader in that pack, having released 18 years of her taxes. Over the weekend, she railed against the NRA, and、uh, Bernie Sanders came to San Francisco. Sixteen thousand people showed up on a, a pretty nice afternoon and、uh, listened to him、uh, speak. And what else do we have? Well, Cory Booker is being、uh, questioned about when he was the mayor of Newark, and he established a zero policy, a zero tolerance policy on criminal behavior. That led to charges of racial profiling and other police misconduct. That they say that、uh, Mr. Booker went light on. I want to thank Jerry Freshia for sending me a piece that was published a few weeks back by Les Leopold, called "Beware the Moderate Democrat," and he makes a really good point that polls show that only 3.8 percent identify as moderate, socially liberal, and fiscally conservative. And that that is too weak of a base for a Democrat to run on, and I think it's a good point. And finally, today here in San Francisco, the Giants baseball team is reeling from the decision by Major League Baseball Commissioner Rob Manfred that the team president Larry Bayer is going to be suspended through July 1st. Now, I guess everybody's seen the TMZ video where Larry got into an argument with his wife Pam. She grabbed his phone, and in trying to wrestle it back from her,、uh, she fell to the ground, and he kind of stepped away. And I believe that this case is being blown way out of proportion. I do think it's a personal dispute, and that when domestic violence activists impose their own zero tolerance on human relationships, I think we all lose. Thanks for listening to my ranting and raving, my daily news and comment podcast. You're free to share it all over the place. You'll find it on YouTube, and I'm still Peter B. Happy trails to you until we meet again. Happy trails to you. Keep smiling.、Up.